All right. I'm going to cut that by 30 seconds and just go ahead and get us started now. <laughs> um, so welcome and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, this is always a highlight of the month for us when we get to do these presentations for you. So um, it means a lot to us when you join us. Today we are focusing on vacations. Um, it's a lot of fun. And a uh, quick note, many of these oral histories were recorded on paper only not in an audio recording. So we have enlisted the help of friends and colleagues to help read some of these for us. Um, you can hear the differences in the old recordings from the new ones, but it's still very enjoyable and I think you'll still get a kick out of it. And as always, we have, and you have the expertise of Anne and Judy to guide you through this lovely presentation. So um, the volume is up as high as it can go on my computer and the benefit of a lot of these being recorded just in the last couple of weeks is that the sound is a little better. Um, but as always, please just make sure your volume on your own computer is up and that will help with the audio uh, piece of this. And we probably won't go over, but in case, I always like to make sure we let everyone know we might go over by five minutes or so. So if you have to jump off at the top of the hour, no problem. And if you can stay on, if we're going to go over a little bit, we'll always finish out the last one or two slides if we have them. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Judy. Thank you, Alicia. And a, really a shout out to Alicia who does a lot of the heavy lifting getting the oral history quotes and the photographs together. So I want everyone to just give a virtual clap to Alicia and of course to Anne, so great to be here and Amber who is in the background running the program. So as Alicia said, today we're gonna focus on what community, mem community members talk about when they talk about taking a vacation. It's a vast subject, of course. So we're limiting this presentation to vacations on the Northern Oregon coast, because when we started going through our oral history clips and the stories, we realized that we could just really focus on trips to the beach. We've got our chat button open. We'd love to hear your stories too. If anything you're listening to, perk something, put it in the chat. We wanna know what, where you vacate, where you take vacations to. Thought we'd start maybe with just a little bit of background. So when we think about visiting the Oregon coast today, we really don't have to think too much about how we're getting there, right? We drive on cars, we've got pretty decent roads and highways, easy enough to get there. And when we think about what we're gonna do when we visit the coast, what comes to mind? Do you think about maybe visiting the smokehouse in Rockaway, the aquarium in Seaside, shopping in Cannon Beach? Again, you're welcome to put your thoughts in the chat. But of course, before the days of white settlement, access to the coast was really, really limited. Um, it wasn't until after the California gold rush, the Oregon donation land law of 1851, that white settlers flooded the Oregon territory and new towns sprung up along the coast. They were there specifically to provide lumber, fish, shellfish, other goods to the booming California economy. And there were also in, uh, really ambitious hopes for tourism. You know, it was beautiful at the coast. So throughout the late 1800s, the first decades of the 20th century, roads and bridges were constructed, railroads were laid and improved. So you first had the more established German Jewish families. This was the first immigration of Jews into Oregon. They began to arrive in the mid 19th century and they were building their homes in Seaview, Washington and Gerhardt. And then as the second wave of Jews arrived, these were Jews who came from Eastern Europe and, and um, Russia, they too found the Pacific Ocean compelling. They seized upon the spirit of vacationing really within a few years of arriving in Oregon. So even though traditional Judaism may discourage activities not connected with religious events, these newcomers, these new immigrants to Oregon, they rapidly found that the vacation was a worthy feature of American life. Vacation symbolized the promise of American abundance. They brought Jewish immigrants closer to fulfilling their expectations of what this country had to offer. And when we think about Jews on the East Coast, where did they go? They went to the Catskills, they went to Atlantic City, they went to Miami Beach. Here, Jews flocked to the Oregon coast and, and Oregon coast and Southern Washington coast. It had a family-friendly atmosphere, multitude of activities. It was affordable. So it really did make it an ideal place to visit. So as you can see on your screen, these two um, these two slides, anyone who knows me 
has probably heard me talk um, ad nauseum about these two images, but they do represent, in my mind, the absolute culmination of the American dream. So the photo on the beach, that's Adolf and Fanny Milstein. If anybody knew George Bodner, these were his maternal grandparents. They're sitting on the beach in 1923. They might have only been able to afford a night or two and possibly not in particularly luxurious surroundings. I've studied this pho photograph for years now. I really think that um, they look pretty proud. Of course, they're squinting in the sun. I do get that. But I think they look very proud to be there. And of course, she is wearing a bathing suit. You, If um, anybody recognizes that was a bathing suit from the 1920s, but no way he was going to put on a bathing suit. He is wearing his suit and sitting in the sand in his suit. And of course, the other image is um, car ownership, the other culmination of the American dream. That's a photo of Salman Ashi with his father, David. They're really very proud to be pos um, posing in front of their car. And of course, the car is something that made getting to the coast much easier. So I'm just going to leave you with a quote that came out of a newspaper called The American Israelite in 1903. And the quote reads, the vacation habit is unquestionably stronger among the Jewish poor than among any other poor class. One would never think of an Italian laborer or an Irishman working on a street railroad, sending his wife and children for the summer. Yet the Jewish worker does this year after year. So I'm going to pass it over to Anne. And go ahead, Anne. Thank you. Um, so we can, um, oh, there we go. Um, we're going to talk first about how people got to the beach. And Judy mentioned that car travel made it easier, but there was a long time before car ownership was common and a long time before the roads were travelable by car to make it, to, to make it a comfortable ride. Um, so we're not going to do all of our quotes in chronological order, but we are going to start with the earliest one. And this is Amanda Grimm talking about um, her family. And we have many other stories, too, of, of people traveling. These are the people who were going up to southern Washington, the earliest, the earliest Jewish Oregonians who were doing this vacation went up to to Long Beach and Seaview in in Washington State um, and it was a long trip let's just listen to what she has to say about it you went to the coast in, on uh, in horses oh yes it took two days <laughs> yeah everything was loaded in the wagon and uh, uh, went through the woods most of everything was forest in those days too but oh, it was a grand thing. Oh, the roads were everywhere were just uh, trails, you might say. Mm -hmm. We used to call them, a lot of these roads, wagon trails, because it still had stumps right in the middle of the road. Some of them had trees right in the middle. You'd have to go <laughs> around one side uh, or the other side, and you, you drove around one side until the mud hole got too deep on that side, and then you started going around the other side. <laughs> Uh, she said it takes two days to get there. This is, it's good to keep in mind, they were going for a long time. They were going for sometimes for months and months. They would they would be going um, to get out of the city and spend time at the beach. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a bit, but um, it certainly wouldn't be a good weekend trip. Um, the early automobile travelers used what was then called the old highway to Astoria, and that um, now it's all paved and beautiful, but it's the road that you take if you follow Highway 30 up um, through Scapoose, and you go um, up and then over to Astoria, and it was very windy, twisty. I love this image of, of it just, it makes me sick even, even imagining driving on that road. Um, it went all the way through the coastal range and up, and it seems that Bradley Park was the place where, where people would stop. That was the popular spot to stop and let your kids throw up and then enjoy the vista. Um, so here is Evelyn Leshgold telling us about, about her family's trip. The old road through our story was very curvy and long. Parents had to stop several times to let their children throw up along the way. 
We stayed for several weeks at the beach because it took a day or two to recover from the five hour drive. Now, um, with families being gone for such a long time, that meant that either the husbands and wives were separated from each other for the summer or, um, or the husbands had to figure out how to get to the beach. And in this next clip, um, Millard Rosenblatt um, brings up the, the concept of the, of the dads coming out just for the weekend. And we're gonna talk even more about that later. But um, these commuter trains that were affectionately known as the papa trains or the daddy trains um, would accommodate the businessman's schedule. The, the fathers would work during the week and then come out and join their families on the weekend. And they might do that all summer long. Gearhart was a, in the early days, was the social center of the, of the West uh, for some reason or another, uh, not entirely Jewish by any means, yeah. and partly Jewish. There were quite a few Jewish people, both from Seattle and Portland. But uh, you could get there by train, and the men from Portland could come down Friday night or Saturday and go home Sunday night and, and see their families who stayed there all summer. Yeah. And uh, it didn't take too long, four hours or so on the train. And there were no cars to speak of in those days. Uh, and eventually they, it took quite a while. I remember the first time I ever went to Gearhart in an automobile, it took seven and a half hours. But uh, it was quite a, a, a social area in the early days. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to give you an idea of some of the timing, um, it, it, the, the, the original way to get to the coast was to take a ferry either from Portland or from Astoria. If you took a ferry from Astoria, you had to drive that, you, you had to drive the, the old highway that I was just telling you about, or you could get on the, you could get on a boat in Portland and take it to Astoria and then take the ferry boat across to Washington. Um, and when you got there, you got on the Little Iwako Railway. It was a little narrow gauge railroad that ran all the way up the Long Beach Peninsula. Um, and that train evidently was an adventure in itself. It, it stopped so people could picnic along the way and pick wildflowers and um, go fishing and sightseeing and it didn't get anywhere very quickly. So um, you, you, you were along for the ride when you took it. And here's this picture is of one of the ferry boats there, I actually know the name of the ferry that left Portland. It was the T.J. Potter, and it left Portland um, at one in the afternoon, so that the men could work on Saturday morning. They kept their businesses open on Saturday morning, and at one in the afternoon, I think later on, um, it even left later than that, um, and got to the Megler Dock in Astoria four hours later. And the, the train and the ferry were well-timed so that the, the, the Papa train was waiting and they put on extra flat cars to, to take the fathers on board. Um, and then the train and the steamer coordinated for the Sunday trip back home. And they left late on Sunday evening so that, the, so that the families could have as long on the beach as possible. So here are, I, I think we'll just play three in a row of, of um, people talking about the ferries and train trips. We went across the, across the ferry. And, and we loved the ferry. There was a slot machine on the ferry. My little sister and I loved that. We saved nickels up and so we could play them. And we really loved going to the beach whenever we got invited. We first went by train and then took the ferry. And then on the other side of the Columbia, there would be a, either a in my day, there was a train, another train that took us down to see you. It was a full day's journey. I can remember sitting in the in the parlor car with the seats that went around, and the the black porter would keep the fireplace going in the train, and so, so we'd, we'd be warm. And then when we got down 
to Astoria, we had to go over a trestle, and I can remember being afraid that the train would fall into the Pacific and I would no longer be there, but it never happened. Yeah, we'd go down with trunks and maids and spend the whole summer down there. My maternal grandmother was known to load her pots and pans and linens along with her brood and proceed from Portland to Long Beach Peninsula. Getting there involved the service of a transfer man, two trains, one from Portland to Astoria, and the wood burner from Megler to Long Beach, and between them, the ferry across the Columbia. I just have to take a minute to, to love the Pacific Northwest summer, where you have to have a fire on the train to keep you warm in the summer. Um, all right, so going on. On with our, our train theme, we're going to hear Vivian Bonin next, who um, um, she, she made the transition from train to car, as several of these people have mentioned that, that they started out going on trains and then later they went by car. Um, in 1896, the first train connected Astoria with Seaside. And that opened up Seaside as a possibility for, um, for so many people. So like Judy was saying at the beginning, it was the Jews of German descent who came first and they were the first ones who had the means and the ability and they did their vacationing um, on the Southern Washington coast. And then when Seaside opened up as a possibility I don't know if it was cheaper to rent in Seaside or if it was just more convenient to get there without the ferry, but um, the Eastern European Jews tend and flocked to, to Seaside, Oregon, and um, for many decades, that was, that was the main destination for Portland's Jewish population. Um, so you had to get to Astoria still, so you could do that by taking the ferry from Portland to Astoria and then the train down to Seaside, or you could you could brave the road and drive to Astoria. Um, let's see, I think just a few years later, by, the, by 1900, there was a train that went all the way from Seaside to Portland and Portland to Seaside. So um, train travel was, was the way to get there until the highway opened and that was, 1946 was um, when the the, the uh, Sunset Highway opened, Highway 26 opened to get to Seaside very quickly. And of course, things changed rapidly then and train travel pretty much died down. So let's hear Vivian. My father would take the family down on a Sunday by train, later by car, and we would rent a little cottage very near the beach. The following weekend, he would take the train back to spend the day with us. Then the last weekend, he would return to pick us all up and we all took the train home together. All right, now we're gonna go back over to Judy and, and stop talking about how we got there and talk about where we stayed. Where we stayed, although Anne, I was disappointed that you didn't have any um, stories about throwing up on the train or the ferry because I bet there were some. I'm sure that there were, <laughs> nobody mentioned. <laughs> Right, exactly. Um, well, so as Anne mentioned, you know, there were a lot of coastal towns that became vacationing spots for Oregon Jews. Um, you could hear from the clips that Anne played. We saw they were in Longview, Sea View on the Washington side. They went to Astoria. They went to Seaside. Here's a photo of Seaside. Here's a photo of Cannon Beach. And here's a photo of Gerhardt, right? And, and they also, of course, went to... Um, counts further south. So the first clip in this grouping, there are just three clips in this grouping. The first clip we're going to play is from Seaside. So Seaside, as Anne mentioned, the Eastern Europeans and the Russian Jews from South Portland, they relocated. This was the, the place that they relocated to for several weeks each summer. If you think back to the Milsteins on the beach, that's where they were in Seaside. So they would relocate to Seaside. They'd rent cottages and they typically tried to be in the same block. So North 3rd and 4th Streets, if you know Seaside, there were a lot of Russian Jews who relocated there. Some eventually were able to buy or build their own homes. And in fact, 
they, they, they formed a neighborhood of middle-class Jews at Seaside South End, kind of replicating what they had achieved in, um, in South Portland. Seaside itself was the high fashion resort. It was described as early, I think, as 1894 as the oldest fashionable summer resort on the Oregon coast. And in 1958, so um, more than 50 years later, it was actually titled the Atlantic City of Oregon. So Alicia, let's just play the first clip, which is Rosalie Goodman, um, and she's in Seaside. My mother and I would stay at the Seawater Apartments. This was a rented room with a little kitchen right above the aquarium. At night, you could hear the sea lions clapping and barking. It was small, but it had a bathroom and a little pull-down bed. We didn't complain because it meant we got to spend a week at the beach. I remember during the war years when we walked around at night, we had to keep our flashlights pointed straight down at the ground. Inside, we had blackout curtains on all the windows. I was really glad that we have this clip of what it was like to take a vacation in the wartime, right? And I think Rosalie just said it all. They had to have the blackout curtains and they had to be very careful because they didn't know what else is out there. But I think it's also worth mentioning the changes that occurred in Jewish communities after the Second World War, which made it even easier to, to go to the beach. Restricted covenants ended. This was the practice by banks and realtors to restrict certain areas from ownership um, from those deemed unsuitable. And it definitely affected home ownership for Jews in certain areas of Portland. Career opportunities also opened up after the war. Jews were much, much more able to climb the corporate ladder, um, having sort of demonstrably um, shown their loyalty to the United States by fighting in the war. And while much less so in Oregon, the concern about anti-Semitism, it was always there. Um, especially as American Jews became more established. And I just want to mention that in the 1940s, the Anti-Defamation League actually created a film that to alert Jews to the behaviors that triggered anti-Semitism. And these were specifically related to behaviors that they felt were um, demonstrated at the coast, whether the Oregon coast or um, the, Atl the Atlantic Ocean coast, but behaviors such as playing cards on hotel porches, being assertive in cafeterias, having loud arguments in hotels. So there was actually this film that um, was kind of helping Jews understand how they behave. Very, very strange, I think. So let's play the next clip. There was no phone in the house for many years. You walked down to the grocery store to make a call. My parents communicated by letters that gave the details of their days while they were separated for the week. So this was Lynn Lois and Marks, and she was speaking from the Long Beach Peninsula. Um, I just have to imagine that I'm not the only one who heard that clip. And we we just, you're like me, you just heard it and you're just longing for this time where you're not absolutely glued to your phone and that you actually could write um, longhand letters. The Long Beach Peninsula, as Anne had mentioned, was accessible by car, by train, by ferry. Several large hotels were built after the railroad came in. Many Jewish families from Portland owned summer homes in the area. Uh, let's go to the next clip, which is Ray Packhouse talking from Seaside. I remember staying at the Dew Drop Inn for $10 a week. There were no inside toilets or showers, but it was a week at the beach within our budget. And I love this quote too, because really what Ray is saying is taking, as I, I as as we mentioned at the beginning of the program, taking a vacation, even if it means a night or two, even if it means staying in a tin shack. If that's what people were doing to demonstrate that they had arrived, that they had an opportunity to fulfill the ideals of American society, the American dream, they were going to do it. So do drop in $10 a week, no toilets or showers, doesn't sound like much of a vacation to me, but they were going to do it. And I'll pass it back to you to talk about social life. I will. And um, Judy mentioned that, that the goal was to replicate the neighborhood that, that they were leaving in Portland. And really, it was replicating the entire life that they had um, 
it it wasn't a get away from it all kind of vacation. I think that that most of these people were after it was a move everything you have and do it at the beach instead of at home. So whole families traveled together, whole extended families traveled together, whole neighborhood areas traveled together. You 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 could end up with the very same neighbors in Seaside that you had um, on the street in Portland, but you were doing it at the beach. And and the pace was slower and it, and it was definitely vacation time. Um, there, there were people who needed to get further away. We get stories of people going all the way down to, to Lincoln City, to Rhodes End, um, a few in Neskowin and a few in Cannon Beach. But um, for the most part, it was a time to socialize with the very same people that you socialized with at home. And here is, let's play the clip of Avalon Leshkold. All the Jewish kids would congregate right off the turnaround near the lifeguard station. When you started for the beach in the morning, you knew that was where you would find your friends. And the bowling alley, that was another big Jewish gathering place. There was a dance hall across the street called the bungalow where we would dance. After dinner, the whole family would walk the prom, then the teenagers could go off to the movies or the bowling alley. It seems to be a nice combination of leave the kids on their own for the day and do things as a family. But um, a lot of the stories that we got when we interviewed people about their vacations at the beach were about whole days without ever stopping back in at the, at the rented house where the kids were just on the beach for the day by themselves and there wasn't a lot of of supervision the moms lots of stories of moms playing cards i don't know if anybody who's watching us has ever heard of a game called pam but they played pam a lot and i don't know how to play that um but in this next clip of leland waltux this is a story where he did get a little bit of of supervision and intervention and i i just love his quotes I have a memory of being dragged out of Christian revival tents by the arm. My cousin Lowell Levinson and I would sneak into the tents of, of, on the beach and sing the hymns with the congregation because they would give us punch and cookies afterwards. When our mothers found us there, they dragged us out saying, these are Jewish children. We knew nothing except we wanted to punch and cookies. That that quote makes me very happy. So little little Jewish children wandering into the tent revival. Um, so to talk a little bit about religion on the beach, um, we're going to when when we get to the food section, you'll see that many of the many of the laws of of keep of being Jewish were suspended for time on the beach, even by people who kept kosher at home. And I think it it was very expected to that that religious observance would um would would be suspended while at the beach but there was a small group of orthodox people who all got together and prayed in in Mr. Boxer's oh gosh I just forgot Mr. Boxer's first name um Judy no okay Israel, um, yeah, Israel, Israel, Bo Israel, Israel Boxer. Boxer. That's right, Israel Boxer's house. He had a little congregation in the back. And now in our collection, we have the prayer books that he used to do that and and the Torah curtain and, and other things from his little synagogue that he ran in the back of his house. And this is a quote uh, from Avril Noodleman about his time there. And we didn't have any pictures of the little sanctuary, but we thought you'd appreciate a little picture of Avril Noodleman there enjoying the enjoying the rides. I recall attending the shul in the back of Mr. Boxer's house on the prom at 8th Street. It was a small uh, building attached to his house in the backyard that he had converted into a small shul, maybe big enough to seat around 15 people. We had Sidurim, we had a uh, Sefer Torah, uh, Talisim, um, everything there for a um, Shabbat morning services, in which we'd have Shabbat morning service, uh, and sometimes a Friday night uh, even, uh, between Memorial Day and Labor Day. And Mr. Boxer, or um, 
my mother's cousin, uh, Joe Blumenthal, would uh, conduct the services in the shul. And I remember Mendel Hockfeldt riding over on his bike on Saturday afternoons to my house after I became a bar mitzvah to have my mother wake me up and say that they needed uh, me for the minion. Uh, there wasn't enough room for a woman's section. If a woman wanted to say a yard site, she had to sit outside. And um, I remember once Molly Boyarski had a yard site and she had to sit outside in the rain. And boy, that made a lot of people angry and um, caused quite a stir. Anyway, uh, I do have fond memories. Uh, praying at the beach really heightened my love for Yiddishkeit and being Jewish. Uh, I would sit in that little shul thinking that all over the world, far away from uh, little seaside Oregon, Jews were reading the same uh, passages out of the Torah. And it gave me a, a feeling of belonging to something very special. There have been a couple of attempts over the years um, beyond that to have services at the coast, um, usually but from usually these attempts were Portland residents who were at the coast trying to make um, trying to make a, a prayer group there. We're going to hear Bernice Manashi talking about another one, but there is a congregation and I the we don't have any quotes about congregation Bates Salmon, House of Salmon, um, that has been running at the coast, maybe because it wasn't about vacationing. That's probably why. Um, so here, but here is Bernice Menashe talking about a much later um, congregation that formed. All right, go ahead. In 1993, Frida Tobin formed a group called the North Coast Shabbat Group. We meet once a month on Friday night for services. It began in people's homes, but it grew so much that we now meet at the Senior Center in Seaside. There are guest leaders who do a wonderful service for as many as 75 people. A large group met every Labor Day weekend for a hike up Tillamook Head. It got to be a big event. Rabbi Joshua Stamfer would lead the group, and when we got to the top, we had wine and snacks and blew the shofar. Then he led us in prayers as we watched the beautiful ocean and the sky from on high. That sounds like a religious experience. All right, back to you, Judy. Great, I get to talk about another religious experience, food, right? Who doesn't, who doesn't enjoy food? Um, and as Anne mentioned, you know, I, adaptability. I think that is the key word about this relocation of Portland Jews to the coast. Really what they were thinking is what part of life in Portland could transfer to the coast? What part did they need to adapt? So let's just listen to the first clip of Barbara Durkheimer just talking about being in a store there. So let's just hear that. To us, shopping at Sugarman's was like visiting family. They bought their goods from my grandfather's business. The best part was the charge account. The kids came in and charged their ice cream cones and candy, and the parents paid the bill every month without knowing what we had bought. <laughs> that, I love that, right? I mean, they just, it was free reign. The kids, as Anne was saying, the kids could really do what they want. This, um, Barbara was in Seaview. It was her grandfather's business was called Wadhams, just uh, coincidentally. But there was another aspect, um, Anne mentioned it, and that was for those families who kept kosher. What did they do when they got to the beach? So some people continue to keep kosher homes. So maybe in case anybody just needs a tiny, tiny little bit of background about keeping kosher. So if you're sorry, you have to source, you have to prepare foods that follow certain rules that dictate. Um, and these rules dictate what you can do and what you can't do. Some some animals, some, uh, you know, some animals are just off limits because they don't meet certain requirements. So for example, kosher foods that come from the sea, which is really what we're talking about, they need to have both scales and fins. So a lot of popular seafood like crab, lobster, shrimp, and clams are not kosher, right? But then at the coast, digging for clams was one of the most favorite activities for vacationers. Everyone from little children, to older generations could do it together. So it was seen to be this wonderful 
multi-generational activity. But I think there are more. I think that clamming was a way that this first, particularly this first wave of Jewish immigrants, and you'll see from the, the one photo of clamming, it, it, it's an older photo, but it, it was just an, a, another way to show national allegiance. Like we are American, and if you go to the ocean and you dig for clams, we're gonna do it too. And then it gets kind of funny, and you'll see this in the quotes we're gonna play. So some, some Jews would go and they'd report that only, a few households allowed the clams into the kitchen while on vacation. You could eat the clams, but if you wanted to keep your own home kosher, you'd just have to bring what you collected to someone else's house where they could be cooked and eaten. So we've got three great, I think they're great, clam digging quotes. So let's just play them all at once. My cousin, Linda Slifer, was the leader of the pack. She was the fastest clamor the world has ever seen and we, could, we would follow her lead. She would get up at six in the morning or whenever the tide was out and knock on our doors and wake us up. Um, it would be hardly daylight. And we would bring back a bucket full of clams. Only Linda's mother, um, Ida Slifer, would clean and cook the clams for us. None of the other mothers wanted them in the house. <laughs> Okay, one experience. Let's and, hear another. Uh, my grandfather, of course, who was raised in in Europe, where everyone was kosher, but they weren't too strict. They wouldn't not have unkosher food in the house. But he really loved hard shell clams on a half shell. However, he was embarrassed by the thought of God watching him eat that. So we would open a clam and hand it to him, and he was turned his back toward God and swallow it. My mother kept a kosher kitchen in Portland, but the beach had its own rules. She cooked clams, crabs, sausages, the whole time we were there. None of her sisters wanted them in the house, but my mother would cook up our clams for us. <laughs> So three kind of distinct, but, you know, similar experiences, again, showing adaptability, just showing that these, these Jews, for the most part, they just wanted to fit in and they were going to, they were going to make their own accommodations, whether it's turning your back, because you think that would be a way that you wouldn't be noticed, whether it's going to someone else's house to cook the unkosher food, there were just always workarounds. And back to you. Great. Well, in addition to clamming and uh, sneaking into the tent revivals, the, the, the daily activities of people at the beach didn't vary very much. There was the, There's a lot of sameness in the kinds of things, just the things that you would expect. And I thought we would just play some quotes of people um, talking about what they actually did on the beach all day. Let's start with Barbara Durkheimer. Bud Salling would wake up every morning. Regardless of the weather, he'd gather the group from their individual houses and lead them into a run to the beach and into the surf. Daisy Lowenson would take her blanket each afternoon after lunch and nap in the sun on the sand dunes. Uh, let's keep going, Leash. The same would apply to bonfires which we held oh, every uh, four or five uh, nights. And uh, it was great fun building these uh, bonfires, trying to see if we could have the biggest bonfire on the beach. And you would look all the way down to Long Beach on one side and up to Seaview and uh, north on the other side, uh, hoping you'd have the, the biggest uh, bonfire. Uh, you pop popcorn over the fire, or you uh, dug uh, the, the potatoes in the coals so they became uh, roasted. And uh, then you would uh, bring up logs alongside to be warm, and uh, then you would sing songs. I think this we one is- We learned how to ride bikes on the prom. The sound of a bicycle bell still brings us back to the prom with our little dog, Fluffy, riding mm -hmm. in the front basket. <laughs> I, I think that last one is, is particular to Seaside and maybe to Cannon Beach where the paved sidewalks and the, and the streets, and of course the promenade in Seaside 
were so attractive for yeah, kids would would roller skate down them and and bicycle down them. You had that that um, open open air feeling without cars to to worry about for kids to be on their bikes and on other wheels. So we're going to go now to back to Judy. Yeah, we're just going to continue. Thanks, Dan. We're going to continue in this theme. And, you know, again, just to um, make the point again, you know, when they were by their early teens, these young teenagers were really able to be at the beach without their parents. So that's a lot of freedom. The beach was the social gathering place, right? And actually some kids had ability to drive, right? I think um, you could be younger than 16 and drive a car in those days. So they could drive themselves to the beach and they could even, you know, they could stay at the homes of friends, right? The parents of um, friends of theirs. So a lot of freedom. So one of the things that happened at the beach, of course, is people fell in love. Uh, again, if you have stories about falling in love in the beach, we'd love to hear them. Put them in the chat for us. We just have one clip. It's a good one. So we're just going to play a, a clip of Helen Stern, who is in Seaside. And you can see Helen and who she's talking about in the photo. Two years later, I was at Seaside, turnaround, where all the Jewish kids hung out. And Jerry was there. And I walked up to him and said, hi, you don't remember me, do you? And he said, no. But um, we just hit it all. We're about 19 then, 18 or 19. And we got married two years later. That's just one of a number of stories. We were, we, at one point, we thought, well, we should just make a list and read out aloud all the beach romances that turned into marriages and children and grandchildren. And then we thought, yeah, you'll come in and do research in the archives and we can share that with you. So there's another aspect of going to the beach that came out. We actually had, um, more than the two clips we're going to play for you. But guess what? Some people hated the beach. And we just, we find that whole thing absolutely hilarious. So we're just, let's just play these two clips, Alicia, um, back to back, because they're, they're funny. My mother, Beatrice Lovey Israel, hated the beach. <laughs> Even as a young girl, she hated all the preparation that went into the trip. When she had her own children, she complained to us all the time about the cooking, the planning, and the schlepping involved in just getting to the beach. She told us that she felt it was never worth the trouble. <laughs> I hated the beach. I loved to be with family and friends at Seaside, but I hated the sand and the way it felt on my feet, the way it got into everything. I hated the cold water of the ocean. My memories of Seaside are all positive, despite that. Don't you just love that? My memories of Seaside, they're all positive, despite, despite the fact that I hated the beach for the reasons that I, that I enumerate. Um, I think it was hard not to, not to love the beach, right? Anne, were you going to say something? Sorry. Well, I can completely understand how these women who had to transport their whole their whole kitchens and and child rearing and everything to a place where they didn't have all the things that they needed with them. And um, there they, you know, we do have the stories of women sitting and playing cards at the beach, but they were also feeding large numbers of people and, and shopping and doing all the things that they had to do at home where it was more convenient and having to do it at the beach where it was less. Right. Not exactly a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> for the women. And I think that's very true. And keep going. I think you've got a few other uh, people to talk about. Yes. Um, um, I, I like the, the the image that Bess Levinson brings in the next one of of the old people sitting out on the beach, which is like, well, let's 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 listen to the this is a nice long quote from Bess Levinson. My mother, Leah, would sit out on the sand under a huge umbrella doing her needlework and sewing. She'd take a walk, when she felt like it, down to the hot baths at the natatorium for a soak. The whole family spent the afternoon on the sand. My parents used to go to the beach with Abe and Razel, and with Sam and Rivka in the early days. At first, they went to Long Beach in Washington. They went up on the train. They kept kosher, and they had to take all of their things with them up there. Later, when they had a family, they went to Seaside. 
Moisha would bring kosher meat with him when he came from the city on weekends, and then the family would eat meat. Otherwise, they ate fish and vegetarian. Um, I guess that's a nice feature of, of eating at the beach. It's easier to keep kosher if you're eating fish and, and vegetarian food than it is if you if you have to bring meat with you, as long as you avoid the clams. Right, not avoid the clams. And then our last quote, I think, is, no, not our last quote. One more after that. Oh, okay. The, um, the last quote of, of, of this section um, is, again, hearing Rosalie talk about, about just being in the sun. As teenagers, we basked in the sun. We baked ourselves all morning, and then we came in for lunch before returning to the sun again. We would lie on our stomachs in a circle to play 21 while canning our backs. The picture says it all. And our memories, right? I hope, so, I, I, I'm sure many of us have memories um, sunning ourselves, which we're really not allowed to do for medical <laughs> reasons, right? They didn't have sunscreen back there, but boy, they had a good time. So those are the clips. We have um, just one concluding clip to play for you. We're really at the end of this program. But, you know, I, as we hope you can see, vacations really played a key and continue to play, of course, a key part in the Oregon Jewish experience. And as, I, as I've said more than once already, but I'll, I'll say it again, it really offered opportunities for Oregon Jews to embrace American ideals and try on new identities. So if, if I may, I think while on vacation, Jews were really offered an opportunity. They were able to navigate their class standing, their use of leisure time, and their place in the social pecking order. Because, you know, the, the, if you think back to that clip of the Milsteins, they were on the beach. They probably stayed in a not a particularly elegant place where you had Ray Paco staying at the Dew Drop Inn for $10 a night without um, toilets or running water. So as Jews became more prosperous, things improved for them. And of course, on vacation, Jews could create or adapt as we saw with the keeping kosher or their religious observance. Jews could create this language for vacationing that met, uh, I guess their larger, if you might, their, their larger communal objectives. They broke through the restricted covenants, expectations of class, and definitions of how they're going to spend their leisure time. So they really did find a way to preserve their own cultural identity while embracing the good life. Things are very different today, right? Jewish vacationers travel far and wide as global travelers. They have economic mobility, air, they have airplanes, greater social equality. These have all opened up a lot of possibilities. Um, and so, you know, I, I would say for the Jewish community, our vacation patterns certainly closely resemble those of anyone else. But of course, in addition to that, Jews travel to Israel, they might travel to Holocaust sites, they might go to Jewish museums, please do. We absolutely advocate uh, trips to Jewish museums and they, they visit synagogues in different, um, different places that they travel to. And these, all of these things reinforce their Jewish values and their Jewish identity. And of course, vacations continue to expand the realm of possibilities that you're going to hear in this very last clip that we're going to play to you uh, to close out today's program. The prosperity of the late 1950s and 1960s meant that families could take different kinds of vacations. The beach was all that was available to our parents. By 1960s, we started going to Lake Tahoe for a couple of summers and down to Los Angeles or San Francisco or Palm Springs. In the late 1960s, we went to Hawaii for the first time. Seaside wasn't forgotten, but we could afford to go further away for vacations. And that, of course, the image that we're showing you is um, uh, getting on an airplane to go to Hawaii, right? Or perhaps coming, I guess, getting on the airplane to go to Hawaii. Anne or Alicia, do you know? That's what it is. That's what, it is. That's what they're doing. Yeah. So I think that wraps up. Um, Anne, Alicia, any last words of wisdom about 
No, we all should go on vacations, right? It's time. <laughs> Just listening to this makes me uh, really want to go to the Oregon coast. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Really huge shout out to Alicia and Anne for just being great colleagues and doing such great work in the archives um, for the museum's collection. And to Amber, our, our silent partner on this um, occasion who, who ran the tech for us. So thanks everyone for joining. We're, we're stopping a little early, but I think it's always good to return some time to people. All right, thanks for joining. We're gonna be back in the new year with um, a program about uh, Jews at work. So merchants and something else, Merch merchants, Shops. department stores. Shops. Thank you, yeah. merchants and department stores. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye everyone, bye.